Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Roderick Flood, the provost of the college, and I'm delighted, as usual, to welcome you to a Gresham lecture. Um, and particularly delighted today to welcome Tony Travers, our speaker. Um, I've known Tony for many years, um, and he is, he's the director of the Greater London Group at the London School of Economics. Um, and I think he can claim to be one of, or probably, possibly the foremost expert on local government, and particularly the government of London. Uh, you will, I'm sure, have heard him on radio or television. Um, he has an enviable ability to explain the most arcane details of local government finance in a clear and concise manner for a lay audience. And therefore, we very much look forward to him explaining the arcane details of what a former town clerk once described to me as the oddest institution of local government in the United Kingdom, the City of London, um, which, of course, is one of the patrons, sponsors of Gresham College. So it's very appropriate that we should be considering today, uh, with Tony's aid, the governance and voting system of the City of London. Tony. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Roderick, and thank you to Gresham College for inviting me to speak today. In fact, I have spoken here before, uh, so I'm honoured to be asked back. Um, I'm indeed going to talk about the governance and voting system of the City of London, and you've already got a, a slight sense of how unusual uh, the city is. But I'm going to try and do this through history over time, and then unravel the uh, governance and voting system uh, as best I can. And others in the audience may be able to correct me if I've got any of the details wrong. Anyway, let's begin. Uh, the City of London is an ancient institution with its roots in Anglo-Saxon England. Indeed, the Saxons developed their London in broadly the same place as the Romans had lo located their capital, Londinium, or their capital of this country. Anyway, um, Saxon London operated a form of local government uh, which still has resonance today. Some of the government practices and certainly the names that are used by the corporation of the City of London have their origins before 1066. And this is a remarkably long period of continuous evolution, I would argue, even in Britain, with its ancient monarchy and parliamentary institutions. Now, the City of London had enjoyed, or has enjoyed, rights and privileges since the time of Edward the Confessor, a monarch perhaps better known in history for his piety, and therefore as the founder of an abbey in what was then distant Westminster. And after the defeat of Edward's successor, King Harold, we all know about King Harold from our school days at the Battle of Hastings, um, the Norman King William, William the Conqueror, granted the city its first charter. And this charter can still be seen at Guildhall today under very thick glass, but there it is, you can still see uh, this charter today. Subsequently, the City of London has survived all attempts, and there have been several, to expand it merge it or abolish it. It exists today in 2013 a long time, alongside London boroughs which uh, took control of local government as recently, certainly by the city standards, as 1965. Although, of course, given the extraordinary way in which British governments reorganise all aspects of government other than parliament and government itself, uh, you might argue 1965 is in fact uh, quite uh, the London boroughs having existed since 1965, they themselves are relatively mature institutions. Anyway, for many centuries, the city was London. Under the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, indeed until about 15, uh, 1550, the city was virtually all there was of London. There was some development at Westminster, some across the river at Southwark, which the city had a slightly awkward relationship with uh, from time to time. It was occasionally then sacked by uh, 
those attacking London from the south, and London, there was some development to the east of the city. But most Londoners lived within the ancient city walls. Expansion took place in earnest under the Tudors, who sought, highly unsuccessfully, to constrain the growth of London, uh, and with much faster growth in the 17th and 18th centuries, during which time the city's residents became a minority of the capital's overall and total population. So it's worth getting that in mind, the idea that for a long time the city was all there was of London, and then as the city grew and sprawled beyond the unchanged city corporation boundaries, then, uh, of course, eventually the city became a minority. Now, by the standards of the 17th, 18th, and indeed early 19th centuries, and while England and then Britain developed into a parliamentary system of government with a monarch increasingly, and certainly after Charles I increasingly, as a ceremonial head of state, the City of London was, by comparison with most central and local government institutions, plural and democratic. So uh, if we look at what John Davis in his excellent book, Reforming London, observes, he says, and I quote, an ostensibly democratic constitution had made the city corporation harder to stigmatize than most ancient municipalities when it, that's the city of London, was investigated in the 1830s. At its base were the 26 city wards in which rated householders assembled each December to elect the members of the Court of Common Council. This body was the corporation's main policymaker by this time. So in the early to mid 19th century, it's worth remembering, Parliament still had a number of members of Parliament uh, returned from rotten or pocket boroughs, non-existent places where nobody lived, which were bought and sold. There were few, if any, voters in many parliamentary constituencies. Local government was patchy and badly underdeveloped. Indeed, much of London beyond the city boundaries was parished and not at all well governed. The city, by contrast, had relatively good public services, having secured water supplies as early as the uh, as 1600s and, compared with the rest of the growing metropolis, a tolerable, or at least less inadequate, sewage system. During the 19th century, Davis points out that the City of London built or improved a number of major assets within its boundaries. So it uh, enormously improved Queen Victoria Street, Cannon Street, Farringdon Street, Hoban Viaduct, not so far away, and Ludgate Hill, not so far away. It, it rebuilt Blackfriars Bridge and it removed the tolls from Southwark Bridge. It restored Billingsgate Market and rebuilt Smithfield Market. It also purchased Epping Forest for the public. It built artisans' dwellings well ahead of any, any, other, anybody, any other public authority doing that. It opened the Guildhall Library and created Guildhall School of Music. Now, according to Gibbon, Gibbon and Bell, in their history of the London County Council, and I quote, outside the ancient walls of the city, was confusion almost indescribable. There were, in the first place, 78 vestries with powers as to sanitary nuisances, roads and other matters. There were many different kinds of vestries, commissioners for sewers, sewers and chartered liberties. Overlapping with all of these, there was, for various functions, sewers, paving, lighting, the surveying of buildings, a crowd of different authorities. In all, no less than 300 bodies comprising about 10,500 members, mostly self-elected and with no responsibility to the ratepayers. They operated under about 250 separate statutes, raised rates and loans according to their own fancy, and had numerous unqualified and, and overpaid uh, functionaries. So the authors suggest that the City of London was, compared to the rest of the capital, relatively well governed. So in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, the City of, City of London Corporation was a single unit of government for most or much of what was still, what was by then the built up area of London. It was relatively democratic by the standards of the times and it had better public, sorry, better public provision than the rest of the capital. However, 
from an early part of the from the early part of the 19th century onwards a number of factors were to change the terms of debate first the chaotic nature of local government in the wider, increasingly sprawling and built-up area of what was by then recognised as a metropolis led Parliament and reformers to press for London-wide government, notably to improve sanitation and to provide other infrastructure. Second, there were also calls to reform uh, the, and improve the capital's local government. Large numbers of parishes and ad hoc bodies were seen as inefficient and inequitable. And we've heard from Gibbon and Bell what they thought about it out there. Third, uh, Britain took significant steps towards being a fully developed modern democracy with a wider franchise and crucially, from the city's point of view, moving rapidly towards one person, one vote and reducing the extent of business voting. Fourth, and this is again most important, the City of London in all efforts that were made by Parliament and others to review London's government, resisted pressures, particularly from Parliament, to become London's citywide government. So all these factors began to change the terms of debate, moving on from the city being seen as, by most standards, relatively a model of democracy and good government, to, or more like that anyway, uh, towards being an exception. So once these factors began to affect the terms of debate, the city's form of government began to be seen as increasingly unique and, to some, badly unreformed. And although it, had been it has been changed modestly over the 180 or so years since the 1830s, the city's government today would still be recognisable to those who lived in the capital at the time of the Reform Act in 1832 and the Municipal Corporations Act of 1835, which is pretty amazing if you think about it, though I suspect much the same is true of Parliament and the monarchy, actually, but of which more later. So, and this is where we come to the city's government or governance arrangements today. In 2013, the city's government is based upon 25 wards, not the 26 that Davis uh, referred to. There's now one fewer. These reforms were reformed in 2003, but interestingly retain their original historic names. Many of you will know these names. They are wonderfully evocative. Two I chose just to uh, remind us of is Bread Street and Candlewick, uh, names that even Dickens would have thought long and hard about inventing. These are real names for real wards in the real city. These wards contain voters, and I'll say more about them a bit later, who elect the Common Council and separately elect aldermen. Wards elect between two and ten councilmen each. The Common Council and the Court of Aldermen are chaired by the Lord Mayor, who is assisted by two sheriffs. The Lord Mayor and sheriffs are chosen by members of city livery companies. So that's it, that's, the, that's it, that's simple, that's the description at its most simple. But I now want to unravel each of these processes and sets of institutions. Aldermen originated in Anglo-Saxon England. They were there during the time of uh, the Confessor. And they, at that time, ran the city Having both, having both administrative and judicial functions. From the 13th century onwards, aldermen consulted citizens from their ward about, and quote, common affairs of the city. And from 1376 onwards, there were regular meetings of this common council, this group of uh, people in, interested in the common affairs of the city. This common council has subsequently become the city's governing body. Today, aldermen are still elected, one for each ward, a total therefore of 25, for six-year terms, and they sit on the common council. The common council, which is obviously a more modern institution, has been elected since 1384. And it consists of 100 members plus the 25 aldermen. All out elections for the Common Council occur every four years, with the next being held in March this year, March 2013. In a powerful echo of the past, ward motes, a very Saxon word, I think, ward motes take place once each year in the spring to allow voters to meet their Common Council members in their ward. 
today, the Court of Common Council is analogous to and has the powers of a London Borough Council, although elections in the city, of course, are traditionally not fought on party political lines. The sheriffs, who I mentioned earlier, were until 1199 crown appointments. They collected taxes and represented the monarch in the city of London, as well as fulfilling a number of judicial functions. And it's interesting that, as we'll see a bit later on, the city still has responsibility for some judicial functions, notably uh, the oversight of the Old Bailey, and these can be traced back to these ancient judicial functions handled by sheriffs who were crown appointments. Of course, the sheriffs being crown appointments, it's worth seeing that against the background of King William the Conqueror's uh, building of the Tower of London. The Tower of London, as you will know, is built just beyond the boundary of the city, uh, or his new city as it then was, uh, so as to maintain a watchful eye over it in the Tower Hamlets, just outside the city, so uh, he could keep uh, get a sense of what was going on, this powerful collection of merchants who were working away, had some freedoms, but crucially paid taxes to him. The sheriffs became subordinate to the city's mayor when this role was created in 1189. This was part of the modernisation of the British constitutional arrangements, which of course uh, soon led to the Magna Carta. And the sheriffs now act as assistants to the Lord Mayor of London. There are two of them, and they're elected by the liverymen of the city livery companies for one year each Midsummer's Day. Now we have to look at the livery companies for a moment to explain how they are responsible for the election of the sheriffs and the Lord Mayor. Livery companies have for centuries been guilds based on trade and craft. Today their membership organisations link to professions uh, generally having educational welfare and other charitable functions. There are currently, according to the City of London's website, 108 companies, if the numbers change since it was written, I apologise, 108, I know it does change, 108 companies whose freemen can, following a vote by the court of the company, become liverymen. These liverymen attend Common Hall. Common Hall is an event held each September at Michaelmas to select the new Lord Mayor. Usually this is done by acclamation, there's a great deal of... Uh, uh, preparation for this. It's not quite as surprising as it sounds. Um, so the liverymen attend Common Hall, this event held in September, to select the new Lord Mayor. It's normally, as I say, done by acclamation, though a vote is possible. And to qualify as Lord Mayor, an individual must be an alderman, they must be a sheriff, remember I've talked about these before, and must not already have been Lord Mayor. And like the sheriffs, the Lord Mayor holds office for one year. So now we arrive at the Lord Mayor, perhaps the most visible symbol of the City of London, um, and perhaps most famous for the annual Lord Mayor's show. Lord Mayor has a number of functions, obviously the show being one of them, including being Chair of the Court of Aldermen and Chair of the Court of Common Council. He or she represents the city, that's both the local authority and uh, the city financial, of which more in a moment, within the UK, overseas and to visitors to London. The Lord, Mem the Lord Mayor has a number of other responsibilities, including being Chancellor of City University, a trustee of St Paul's Cathedral, Admiral of the Port of London, Chief Magistrate of the city and, crucially, President of Gresham College. So... I hope that explains how the key figures in the City of London's government sort of fit together. We've got the aldermen with their ancient origins, the Court of Common Council with its slightly, and I do stress slightly, more modern origins, and the sheriffs and the Lord Mayor, the livery companies which are linked to the city, and how these institutions then fit together. They do all fit together and they all link to each other, but it is, I think we can agree, a very long way from a normal or an average borough council. We are talking about something very much steeped in history which operates in a very different way. Now, the electorate 
for the Common Council and Alderman. This is where uh, we do, uh, th there is some complication coming up, so sit tight. The electorate for the Common Council and the Alderman consists of residents, as it would in any other local authority, sole traders working uh, who, whose businesses are in the city, the equity partners of businesses, so if you're a share in a business as a partner, each of you, plus, and that's where the city franchise used to end, actually, but now, plus a number of voters, quite a large number, from incorporated and unincorporated bodies which are located within the City of London. The city was reformed in 2003 to modernise this franchise, particularly bring in these incorporated and unincorporated bodies so that their staff or members could, could take part in the voting rather than the resident sole traders and equity partners who had previously been the electorate for the city. Now, the modernisation in 2001 uh, was an attempt to give greater representation to the largely residential wards, of which there are four, and also to widen the scope of the business vote. So two things went on at, one, went on at once, uh, particularly, as I say, giving slightly greater weight in the system to the four wards where most residents live. A further reform will take place this year, 2013, to change the number of common council representatives per ward, although the total will continue to add up to 100. So that's just a redistribution of the numbers of representatives per ward. Votes are allocated to voters within the relevant incorporated or unincorporated bodies, businesses or other organisations, on a sliding scale that takes account of workforce numbers. Eligibility to vote, and I should say that therefore if you've got a business or an, a body with, uh, sorry, a, an organisation, incorporated or unincorporated organisation uh, in the city with one to nine, a workforce of one to nine, you get one vote, and then it's on a sliding scale as the business get, gets bigger and bigger, as, your, as businesses are bigger and bigger. Votes are allocated to voters within the relevant business or other institution. Uh, in a way that allows eligibility to vote being determined by rules which take account of the length of service working in the city, which must be broadly representative of the workforce, and where the processes for selection within organisations are required to be open and transparent, although there is discretion within organisations about the appointment of voters. And once given the total available to an organisation, it's allocated them within the business, those individuals go on the electoral register along with red, uh, residents and the others as I've described them. So there's an electoral register just like uh, as there would be in any other uh, authority. It's just that and the people are voting as individuals, but not all of them, crucially, are residents. And that is the thing that makes the city's franchise so unusual, so different compared with other local authorities or indeed parliament. Now, the City of London Corporation, with a membership elected as above, has all the normal responsibilities of a London borough, plus substantial additional ones. It run, therefore, as a London borough, it, it runs social care, schools, to some extent, environmental provision, highways, leisure and planning services. But, and this is most unusual for any uh, unitary local authority of the size of a London borough or metropolitan district, uh, the police, the, the metropolitan, sorry, the Corporation of London has its own police force, the city police, which you can see outside uh, uh, for, from time to time. Anyway, so in addition to having its own police force, it has, it operates the Barbican Centre, the Museum of London, London Metropolitan Archives, as I said earlier, it's responsible for running the Old Bailey. It has a large number of tracts of open land over, all over many parts of London, but not only in London, including Hampstead Heath, which for those of you with a long memory will remember it picked up when the Greater London Council was abolished. Uh, Epping Forest, Burnham Beaches, West Ham Park and many others, including in Coulston and elsewhere. The city is also responsible for a number of major markets, Billingsgate and so on, Port Health for the whole of the Thames or most of the Thames and my personal favourite having visited it, the Heathrow Animal Reception Centre uh, where you can go and visit cages with curious creatures that people have tried to smuggle in, many of them alarmingly large 
um, which the City of London tenderly looks after until they can be found new homes. Finally, and absolutely not uh, least, of course, the City of London Corporation, the local authority, promotes the business city, including financial and other professional services right across the UK. And so, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment, the concept of the city can have different meanings. The city can mean the City of London, the local authority that runs the services outside the front door here, but it can also mean, and it's often referred to colloquially, and you'll hear this on the news almost every night, as the financial and business services located in the City of London, Canary Wharf increasingly, and indeed in Edinburgh uh, and other parts of the UK. Now, funding for most of this provision comes from council tax and a retained proportion of the business rates paid in the city. The city is the only local authority that still keeps part of its own uh, business, or at least it will be till uh, April the 1st when the system reforms. But as of today, the city is, one of the, is the only local authority in England that still keeps part of its own business rates and determines how they're used locally. But the City of London also has resources uh, from endowments held within two other sources. One is the so-called city's cash, and the other, the City Bridge Trust. The latter, again, many of you will know probably better than me, uh, was a trust, as its name suggests, originally uh, created to maintain and improve the bridges the city is responsible, responsible for across the river, but which, I think I'm right in saying, um, ended up having more resources in it than the city could reasonably spend on its bridges and is now used for other charitable purposes besides. Now, these private sources, and they are private sources, the endowments, have attracted attention and, it must be said, criticism, mostly on the grounds that some critics believe it's unclear how the resources are used. The city has recently and latterly published much more detail about the use of this endowment income, I think substantially uh, to counter the accusations about the lack of clarity about how the money is used. Now, there can be no doubt that the City of London operates with a very different form of governance and voting system than any other London borough or indeed any other British local authority. It's autonomous, sorry, it's anomalous, it is autonomous, but it's anomalous and autonomous, although only in a way arguably matched by uh, the House of Lords and the monarchy. And I think it is interesting. I've always seen them myself in a bracket with these other two ancient institutions which have somehow survived right to, to, to today and which are, in their way, interestingly fit for purpose but nevertheless significantly anomalous. Now, the fact that the city has 10,000 residents but 300,000 people working within its boundaries is by an order of magnitude different from the equivalent ratio in any other local authority. So if we look at the neighbouring city of Westminster, it has actually twice as many employees in Westminster, 600,000, but crucially, not 10,000 residents, but 220,000. And Camden, like the city, has 300,000 uh, employees, but again, 220,000 residents. So the big difference between the city and elsewhere is this extraordinary ratio of residents to people working within its boundaries. And that is, I think, in a sense, the single um, most powerful remaining justification, certainly from the city itself, about its unusual uh, voting system. Now, of course, from the purest democratic standards, it would be hard not to argue that the city was in some way less democratic than other councils, in the sense that it does not operate on a straightforward one-person, one-vote system. Having said that, it is clearly significantly much more democratic, I would argue, than huge numbers of quangos which run so many services in modern Britain. Even cherished schools and hospitals, after all, uh, all of which are funded with public money, are micro-quangos and in no sense democratically representative bodies. So it kind of depends how you look at the city. If you look at it purely in terms of parliament or any other local authority, clearly different 
arguably less democratic, but compared with many institutions which provide public services in Britain, uh, significantly more traditionally democratic. Now, indeed, in recent years, we've seen the development of a number of new uh, models of governance which move us back towards business voting. Most obviously, business improvement districts uh, and the business rate supplement, which are new mechanisms which, in their way, are broadly analogous to the city within the British system of government. Business improvement districts are micro-organisations which are created by a vote among business rate pairs within their area and, once created, can set a local tax on businesses in the area. The business rate supplement, which is, uh, you will be interested to know, currently being used to fund a third of Crossrail, which is being built under our feet, um, can be, well, more or less under our feet as it turns from Farringdon towards Tottenham Court Road, um, the business rate supplement can be introduced in any uh, part of the country, allowing non-domestic rate payers to, to agree to pay a levy on their business rates, an additional levy, uh, to fund projects related to economic development. So in both these senses, business improvement districts and through the business rate supplement, business voting has re-entered the political system in recent years. So if we stand back and consider the City of London today, it's difficult to better uh, a number of the conclusions of the Herbert Commission on Local Government in Greater London, which uh, reported in 1960. And I'm happy to say one or two of my colleagues who I still see around the LSE uh, created the Greater London Group, which Roderick mentioned earlier, um, which gave evidence in 1957. They're still at the LSE today. Um, they gave evidence in 1957, 58, 59 to the Herbert Commission. Towards the end of the Herbert Commission's excellent and elegantly written report, and where royal commissions were so beautifully written in the past, uh, the Herbert Commission said, and I quote, the city is in some respects a modern local authority. In other respects, it is unlike any other municipality. Its wealth, its antiquity, the enormous part it has played in the history of the nation, its dignity, its traditions, and its historical ceremonial make the city of London an institution of national importance. Hard to better that. I think it's as true today in 2013 as it was in 1960. But Herbert then added, with reference to the possibility of reforming the city as part of the creation of the new London boroughs, a short um, thought which, in a sense, uh, has been the rejoinder of the city through to all time to proposals for reform. And Herbert said this, and I quote, Logic has its limits and the position of the city lies outside them. And I say, I just marvel at the elegance of uh, the writing, uh, the sort of lawyers and grandees who used to sit on royal commissions. Absolutely perfect. Now, so there's no question that the city's long-evolved voting system is unique. But it has to be seen as set within the wider democratic system of contemporary Britain. Not for this lecture, but there's an interesting... Uh, thing to consider this, that it is, of course, possible to have institutions in a democracy which operate in a broadly democratic way, treating people fairly, giving every individual a voice, being plural in their membership, but it's unlikely they'd work as well if they were not set in the firmament of a full democratic system. And I think the importance of the way democratic institutions as it were, feed into less democratic ones, and I'm not talking about the city here, but quangos, is important in its own right, but that's a debate for another day. It's, it's unlikely the City of London Corporation in its current form would be invented today. I think we can agree on that. But then neither would many other aspects of our government system. And I don't just mean the monarchy and the House of Lords here. There are many, many aspects of the way Parliament operates, for example, which I just don't think you'd, you'd do from first principles. It's just not the way you'd do it. I think everybody in Parliament knows that, but crucially, they don't know how to change it, certainly not change the, their own procedures. 
On a number of occasions since the 1830s, the City of London Corporation has survived powerful efforts to reform or abolish it. Each time there has been a major reform of London's government, the city has emerged unscathed. So from 1855 to uh, 1888, the City of London was one of the bo bodies represented on the, it has to be said, rather chaotic joint committee which ran the Metropolitan Board of Works. The Metropolitan Board of Works was, uh, in a sense, uh, London's uh, answer to Paris's Baron Haussmann, uh, which built the few straight streets we have and left us with the uh, elegant embankment and, indeed, crucially, our sewage system, uh, wonderful as it is. The 1899 reforms of London government, which created the metropolitan boroughs within the then new London County Council, which had succeeded the Board of Works, this provided the city with all the powers of a metropolitan borough, but left it with other major responsibilities, such as the police. In 1965, there were further reforms which created the, London, the Greater London Council and today's London boroughs. But this also retained the city alongside the new post-1965 boroughs. And then finally, uh, when the Inner London Education Authority, which had previously been a special subcommittee of the by then former GLC, that's how often London government changes, was in fact the linear descendant of the London School Board, um, which is another thing that had been abolished. Um, anyway, when the ILEA was abolished in 1990, the city became for the first time a full education authority. So, uh, in a sense, was being handed new responsibilities as recently as uh, the abolition of the ILEA in 1990. Now, London is a city whose government is regularly reformed. If we add in the 1829 creation of the Metropolitan Police and the Metropolitan Police District, there were reforms in 1829, 1855, 1888, the creation of the LCC, in 1899, the Metropolitan Boroughs, 1965, 1986, the GLC abolished after just 21 years, 1990 when the ILEA went, and 2000 when the GLA, the Mayor and the Assembly were created. This is going it some, remembering that in New York City there hasn't been a reform since the incorporated city was created in the 1880s. So uh, we do these things differently here. Looking ahead, it's almost inevitable that there will be another reorganisation of London government of, of some kind. And given that history, you'd be unwise to bet against, bet against it. And from time to time, there are proposals to reduce the number of boroughs or to strengthen the GLA's powers. In the matter of reducing the number of boroughs, it's interesting as a good example of depends how you look at it. Because um, having 32 boroughs plus the city, 33 authorities in London, might be thought to be a fair number. But given that their average population is about quarter of a million, uh, those municipalities are among the most populous in the world. 250,000 each. Um, they are very, very large local authorities by international standards. So you may think, one may think there are too many of them, 33 seems a large number for a place like London, but actually given its size and the number of people per borough, um, by international standards, these are some of the largest local authorities in the world, in any country. So it depends how you look at them. But there are proposals from time to time to reduce the number. And any serious proposal that came forward for a configuration of boroughs which resulted in a smaller number than the present 32 plus 1 formation would without doubt create pressure on the city. It would once again, as it had to in the 1830s, in the, 18, in the 1950s and 60s, have to argue for its own continued separate existence. Now, it would be wrong and naive to ignore the fact that the City of London Corporation has attracted new opponents as a result of the fallout from the banking crisis. The City of London Corporation, the local authority, and the City, as I said earlier, the City Financial, are intertwined and inseparable. And indeed, the City has always recognised and promoted that inseparability. The damage done to the reputation of banks and bankers has without question affected the terms of debate. And you will remember that when the Occupy movement set up a uh, home outside St Paul's Cathedral, in the end, the City of London leadership, chairman of the Policy and Resources Committee, um, 
turned up outside the city, as indeed did the Bishop of London and many others from time to time, in order to defend and explain their position. Now, I cite that, uh, not that I personally think uh, the Occupy movement uh, tells us much in the long term about uh, the city or the city financial, but there's no doubt the fact that it raised questions about what the city was, was awkward for the city at the time, and it would be naive to pretend otherwise. However, the City of London, in both senses, that is, the Corporation of the City of London and the City Financial, still have wide support in Parliament and, indeed, among London boroughs. The City Corporation's leaders, notably successive chairs of the Policy Committee, that's the, effectively the leader of the city and the chair of the, effectively the, the, the leader of the Court of Common Council, so notably successive chairs of the Policy Committee since the 80, 1980s have shown extraordinary sensitivity to the changing politics and social realities of the capital. After all, they've managed to steer their way, the city, through the abolition of the GLC and the ILEA and the creation of uh, the GLA and lots of turbulence within the London boroughs themselves and through all of that ended up being respected and seen as sort of neutral throughout which is an extraordinary uh, thing to have achieved. More importantly I would argue its resources, that's the city's resources, the city corporation's resources have been used often charitably and well outside its boundaries. And this, of course, means absolutely crucially to any debate about the future of the city, were there to be one, that if anything were to radically to change the city, there would be many losers and financial losers, charitable and otherwise, outside the city boundaries. And that is always worth remembering. The city funds a large number of things well outside of its boundaries, many of them from private endowments. Uh, and I think some of those who propose changing the city radically imagine that that money would be somehow available for the rest of London. I think just dream on. The Treasury would take it or something. Um, so uh, it is worth remembering that. I think the other thing to bear in mind looking forward, and this is a personal view, very strongly held personal view. Um, I think no one in Britain can surely any longer believe that the structural reorganisation of local government in London or elsewhere is the solution to a problem which could not be solved in another less destructive way. No country on earth reforms local government as often as we do, and indeed if you follow the logic of all the reforms, we will eventually have one council for England. All reforms lead to fewer, and they are all moving in the direction of one. And that cannot be right. So the idea of, as in this sense, personally, I'm a bit of a conservative on this, I just don't think reorganisation of local government or higher education or the health service or anything is other than a, an attempt to evade problems that may indeed need to be solved. And in that sense, um, I think that although there may be calls for a reorganisation of London's government, um, I, I find it hard myself to see what problem such a reorganisation would solve. So finally, finally, all I'd say is this, uh, after nearly 40 minutes on the subject, I think we can agree that despite its unusual, indeed its unique nature, and despite the curiosity of its voting system and the fascinating Anglo-Saxon originated antiquity of some of its democratic institutions, some of them, of course, coming much more recently in the 13th century. Um, despite all of that, um, what you can, without doubt, say, what can say, is that the City of London has proved amazingly adept at evolving to survive. Indeed, it's done it for a thousand years already. And I personally think it would be surprising if it didn't outlast many, and indeed possibly most, of today's political institutions. Thank you very much. Tony, um, we have about a quarter of an hour for questions and discussion, and um, a microphone will come round uh, as you raise your hands. Um, as you think about it, let me ask one question. You said virtually nothing, Tony, about the Greater London Assembly and the Mayor, um, Boris. Yeah. Um, 
but surely that must have had some impact on the city. What do you think that impact has been? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, I stuck ri I, absolutely rigidly to the title I'd been given, so I tried to, like the, rather like the city itself, you know, to pretend there was nothing, uh, nothing around it, um, or over it, or anywhere. That's not strictly true, you know what I mean? Um, I think the, the coming of the new London government, be it the Board of Works, the LCC, the GLC, or the GLA. I mean, I'm, I've said this before. If I were sitting in, if I were the Lord Mayor of London of the day, sitting in Mansion House, uh, looking out over, you know, the area by the bank there, by the Royal Exchange, and perhaps on one of the days when they have big, as indeed there is tonight, big London government dinner, seeing all the people coming in from the other boroughs and the the London citywide government of the day, you would assume that you'd see them all out. I mean, that the City of London would see the latest manifestation of London-wide government through to extinction, abolition and reform. Now, it's true, nobody is proposing to abolish or reform the mayor and assembly system yet, uh, though history suggests that at some point they will. So uh, what's interesting about the, the two mayors we've had so far, and perhaps most interestingly Ken Livingston, is what an incredibly good, given that you know, Ken was a, uh, allegedly a sort of left-wing Labour leader and certainly had form as leader of the GLC in the 80s. I mean, the love-in between uh, Ken as mayor and the city was wonderful to behold. No suggestion at all of any desire among, at City Hall under Ken or under Boris of any desire to upset or indeed undermine the city. In fact, the city, the, the, the new mayor um, and the Lord Mayor have managed to work together in extraordinary um, harmony, I would argue. And um, it's, it, it's a bit, again, it's evidence, I think, of the city, I mean, both the maturity of the mayors of London, Livingston and Johnson to some extent, uh, but also the extraordinary capacity of the city corporation and its leaders, both uh, the policy committee and Lord Mayor, to evolve with the times and to ensure that, they've, that the, the city has used its own, you know, its, its sort of banquets and its, its dip diplomatic functions to slot the new GLA into it as if it had always been there. Uh, and uh, and I, so I think that um, the coming of the GLA has had surprisingly few implications for uh, the city. The only way that it indirectly did, I alluded to, is that, of course, when he was mayor, and, and there have been rumblings from the current administration in much the same direction, almost inevitably the mayor of the day thinks there are too many boroughs. And Livingston in particular, and he's said this again within the last few days, believes there should be five boroughs, as in New York, but he wants them, heaven help us, on what he calls pizza slices. So these would be boroughs of the kind uh, used for civil defence, I think, during the Second World War, when there were um, deliberately created hospital sub-regions in London, which embraced both the city centre and the furthest part of the built-up area. Um, and so the Livingston solution would be five boroughs, one of which would, as it were, run from uh, St. Martin's Lane to Barn uh, to uh, Elstree, you know, one of which would run from uh, Westminster Bridge to Sutton and so on. And the city would have to work very long and hard to be exempted from that kind of solution, I can see. I'm not saying it wouldn't, and that's why I say any reorganisation of the boroughs will yet again put pressure on the city to come up with the reason for its exception. And the other threat, of course, at every point to the city, it comes from the police. And, of course, the police, I'm sure, at Scotland Yard, whatever they say, hanker after a nice, simple control system for London with one police force for the capital. They've seen off the Royal Parks Police, uh, who <coughs> used to exist as a separate force. There's still a British Transport Police operating on the underground. And so, I mean, there are always threats, but as I say, the city's been very, very adept at seeing them off. And I think the relationship with the GLA has been amazingly happy. Uh, Tony, thank you very much indeed for what uh, you, you said. But with regard to the independence um, and uh, the fact that 
uh, most people who stand, stand as independents. You overlook the fact that in 2009 there was a slate of Labour Party candidates. I'll well, uh, confess I did an say interest, I was one of them. I did say traditionally, I carefully said traditionally, uh, in order to get round the fact that there, has been, there have been efforts uh, to push... Um, party politics into the city, into the city and the election for the Common Council, yeah. Right. Thank you. But thank you for making that absolutely clear. Yes. Okay. My question relate, sorry. My question relates to export of the very excellent City of London model of voting and of organisation. Uh, one thing you didn't mention is that soon after First World War, the City of London was responsible for setting up what was in Rangoon, Burma, now Yangon, YMCA, uh, uh, Yangon, it's uh, the YCDC, the Yangon City Development Corporation on the London model, yeah. and it worked brilliantly. Now, the Lord Mayor of the City of London does visit throughout the Far East, and what I'd like to ask you if you had an invitation from the Lord Mayor of London on his next trip for you and he to drop in on Rangoon or Yangon in Myanmar and remind them because what happened was the general stepped in and effectively took away the votes. Mm. But if you could remind them about the brilliant, in fact, make the speech that you just made, which is brilliant, uh, do you think that that is some propaganda which would help the City of London uh, not only to remind them of what you taught them before, but also uh, enable the City of London to get involved in the investment and banking and that sort of thing of that very rich, minerally and in other ways, country. Well, I must say, uh, the, I, I kind of rather like the idea of um, uh, using the City of London's model as sort of uh, to... Um, take on the generals anywhere where well, I think generals should be taken on in, in wherever so um, so but more seriously your point is a, a very good one and in fact I, I haven't researched this in detail but you, and you clearly know more about it than me but I do know that the city model was also the basis of the New York City model when New York City was originally created in Manhattan so it has been exported and of course it's changed elsewhere but the so uh, I'm glad to hear that, in a sense, um, uh, and it, I mean, it clearly this model, whatever people think of it in the UK, the city model today, um, would, I totally agree with you, be better than being run by generals. Absolutely. Thank Wonderful you. though generals are at fighting wars, don't get me wrong, generals are good at what they do, but not for running countries. Uh, two quick uh, technical questions. Uh, what is the ratio between uh, business votes and uh, resident uh, votes? And is the policy committee, um, are the members of the policy committee from the uh, Greater Council, the Grand Council, or are they from outside? Can you just repeat the second part of that? I didn't quite the catch policy, it. The policy committee, yep. uh, the, the members, are they members of the council? or are yeah. they from outside? I mean, I should ask, I may be a member of the Common Council in the audience. I should have asked that before I uh, opined with such um, certainty on it all. Um, the, there's a, there is a majority of business voters. I don't know the exact numbers, but there'll certainly be significantly more business voters than residential voters. The population of the city, about 11,000, and many of them are not, won't be voters. There are residents, particularly in the four wards, but there's a significant majority of business voters, that's for sure. Don't have the numbers to hand. Um, the, the policy committee and, the, and the, um, the corporate, the common council, is the governing body for, as if it were a council in any other local authority. And the precise point was... Are the members are the, of the policy committee members so of the common council? Yes, they are, they are. Sorry, the policy, policy committee members are definitely. And I didn't go into the committee structure. The city, the Common Council has a committee structure which would, would have been recognisable in the rest of local government. In fact, the, local, the rest of local government, though it's slightly moving back towards having committees, um, has moved away from it under government pressure in recent years. But it has committees and all the committees are made up of members from the Court of Common Council.
Sorry? Yeah. And then, yes. Um, I appreciate, Tony, that you uh, stuck, to the, uh, stuck to the title, but if you were going to throw in um, comments about little bits of largesse from the huge city fund, don't you think you should also have then uh, mentioned the damage that the, in these times that the city has done to the national economy and lives of people across the country? And also, do, don't you think that you should uh, acknowledge that I believe you do engage with paid research, inverted commas, for the city? Mm. Absolutely. Um, right, well, in no particular order, let's deal with the second point first. First, of course, my colleagues and I, they're not personally, I might add, um, have undertaken research, as many organisations and institutions do, um, which the city has funded, but the LSE gets the resources. But yes, that's true. Second, um, it seems hard to me to believe that the City of London Corporation, the local authority, can be responsible for global banking failures. I think you could blame financial regulation, you could, or banking regulation, uh, you could blame the overall banking, the banking system and the bankers within it. But uh, it's hard to see how the City of London as a City of London corporation could have done anything about that, with that when, when the UK government didn't either. It, after all, the UK government, has responsibility for financial and banking regulation. So um, I think you could blame the UK government, yep, you know, particularly the last government perhaps, but last government and previous governments. Um, but hard to blame the city as such because it isn't a regulator. That makes sense? You might say that. Um, you mentioned that uh, a large element of the city cash had been built up by endowments over the years. Mm. To what extent do those endowments put any constraints on how the city can actually spend that money? And consequently, if there were future reform to the city leading potentially to its abolition and merger, would, those, would that cash therefore, would those endowments necessarily cause that cash perhaps to go elsewhere? Um, I mean, they are endowments in the way any other endowments have rules attached to them, money held in trust. And it's very hard to change such, I mean, when there are uh, trust deeds or other endowment rules, difficult if not impossible to change how the money is used. So um, whether, it, but it certainly wouldn't be available for, as it were, chopping up and distributing, which I think some people have thought. So you're right. Um, it, uh, but, you know, so quite what would happen to the city's cash and the other resources held in endowment if it were not in the hands of the City of London, you might argue it would just have to be handed across to other charities who then hand it or to charities or to some government agency and they'd have to uh, work with the rules, um, within the rules originally set for the endowments. That's probably what would happen. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, uh, what impact does Brussels or Strasbourg have on the city governance and vice versa? Is the city represented in Brussels or Strasbourg? I mean, Brussels, Brussels and Strasbourg, the homes of the European institutions, um, I mean, don't have, I think I'm right in saying, don't have any direct uh, sway over the government of the city of London, though clearly the City of London Corporation, in its role as promoter of financial and business services, uh, has a great, spent a great deal of time representing itself in Brussels, Strasbourg, and indeed in other multinational institutions responsible for uh, trade, banking, and finance. Um, and indeed, that's something they're pretty explicit about. Whether I, I don't know this, the answer, somebody else may in the audience, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, they, do they have a full-time representative? I just don't know. Somebody else may know the answer to that. I don't. Is there an MEP? Sorry? Is there a, like, an MEP? Well, there's an MEP. There are MEPs for London, and uh, one, all of them 
will represent the city. Uh, but, I mean, the way in which, one of the ways I didn't really point out, it's so obvious I didn't point it out, that the city is unusual, is that compared with other finance centres, um, it's none of them, to my knowledge, or few of them, with the possible exception of Singapore, which is a city-state, have a unit of government which is sort of devoted to the financial and business centre, the, finan the, the central business district for the uh, finance and, and insurance and other business services industry. And it's worth adding, I mean, going back to the point about banking, that banking is only a minority of what goes on in the city. I mean, insurance and so on. Uh, is also, uh, and other business services, consultancies and so on are also pretty important. Um, so um, so I, there's no individual MEP. Indeed, in the, I, mean, the MP, I mean, one of the things in terms of representation, there's an MP currently for the City of London and Westminster. And intriguingly, one of the, uh, de, one of the issues thrown up by the uh, now apparently defunct boundary reforms uh, which have uh, the coalition or the disagreements within the coalition have put an end to, um, is that they, one of the consequences of the boundary reform might have been to create a new constituency of Islington and the city, which would certainly have been a change. Yes, one last question here. Thank you. Now, come, coming back to what was, you said earlier about the uh, financial crisis, if the City of London Corporation is effectively not been tainted by the uh, by the problems of the, of somebody. No, I think it has. Bank. I think it's. I think I don't think it hasn't been. To be honest, I ah, think it is a problem for it. Because my punchline was going to say. <laughs> Um, if uh, that was the case, then if it ain't broke, uh, if, why, why, why fix it? Well, I think, uh, as I said, I, I think that the problems in the banking and finance industry have inevitably had some backwash because of the difficulty of separating the idea of the city financial from uh, the city um, or city of London corporation. I think that inevitably uh, the impact on the City of London because of the banking crisis, failures indeed, must have had some backwash onto the City of London Corporation reputationally. It's hard to imagine that hasn't happened. Even though, as I said in answer to the previous question, the City didn't actually regulate the banking industry. Uh, but, you know, I, and I, th I hope I answered the if it don't break, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it question with my own views about unnecessary reorganisations. I just think, you know, and it's not true only of local government. I think reorganising the health service, reorganising skills training, or oh, that may be needed, but, you know, reorganising everything again and again and again and again is a substitute for making the services better, always. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for that very clear and concise description of what is, I'm sure we all think, a rather peculiar institution, um, but one that certainly is very important to Gresham College. And I think it's true, again, I may be corrected, that the oldest committee, you referred to the committees, the oldest of the committees is the magnificently named Joint Grand Gresham Committee. I didn't know that. Which has the responsibility <laughs> of <coughs> administering Sir Thomas Gresham's bequest uh, and meets four times a year with a very splendid lunch at Mercer's Hall <laughs> to Quite right. do just that. Um, and I'm delighted to be invited to attend on behalf of Gresham College um, and to, to represent the college in the distribution of that particular endowment uh, for the city. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Tony, for that very uh, interesting and, and uh, delightful description of uh, the peculiar institution, this peculiar institution. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.